in this series so far, I've concentrated primarily on stories originating from the Proto-Indo-Europeans, as that is where a significant majority of the academic research and evidence is available. However, there are a group of stories from a place the other side of the world to this that are older than these Proto-Indo-European folk tales. And this group of stories represent the second oldest stories we know of, and that we can date with accuracy. So welcome to the story behind the world's second oldest stories, and welcome to Crackenford. In case you haven't watched the previous videos in this series, the age of a story is determined by academic evidence, not gut feel that the tribes in Africa must tell the oldest stories. And academic researchers strong proof that the average story transmitted by uh, oral telling uh, will tend to survive in its original form for no more than five to eight hundred years. And that is because the core of the story starts becoming obscured by layers of embellishment to sustain the interest as the generations come and go. Now, there are certain circumstances that happen that will allow a story to survive longer. And in the case of the Proto-Indo-Europeans, this was by the story spreading and having so many variants we could bring them back to a single source. But there's also other criteria that will help maintain the original story. And that is that when the tribes telling the stories are isolated and also not affected then by external embellishments and narratives. If this is then coupled with traditional values within the culture, such as values that rely on storytelling for the communication of important information, that place emphasis on the importance of the story, then you have a stage where the stories told have no need to change. Now, alongside this, if the tribe telling the story has an attachment to the location and that this location is in the story, and there is importance to that location, then this too will ensure that any physical geographical features within the story should also remain true. So to allow the story to actually reflect uh, and reference these locations as generations pass. And I say this because there is one place with a culture where the stories and the tribes meet this criterion. And that is in Australia with the Australian Aborigines. Now, the Aborigines are direct descendants of a group of people who managed to leave Africa around 70,000 years ago, and they went walkabout to Australia, a journey completed without interacting with any other humans, as most Homo sapiens were still in Africa at this time, and they managed this journey due to low sea levels, meaning they could literally walk to Australia from Africa via India and Southeast Asia, and they arrived at Australia around 60,000 years ago. Now they managed to pretty much walk into Australia due to the world going through an ice age at the time and this meant a huge amount of seawater was being stored in glaciers and the ice caps and with less water in the sea the sea level was lower and the world looked more like this. The islands of Southeast Asia were a single landmass, and on the other side of the world Britain was part of mainland Europe. But the ice age peaked to 20,000 years ago something called the glacial maximum and the closest towards the equator the glaciers came and after this as the ice melted sea levels rose and this culminated in a final post-glacial sea rise between eight and ten thousand years ago which completely isolated Australia and thus enforcing the necessary environmental changes that helped the Aboriginal oral tradition to keep stories in the near original form for up to ten thousand years. But this wasn't just due to the isolation. We can tell this through the stories the Aborigines tell. So what are these stories and what do they contain that allows us to confirm their age? Well, the stories come in two types, sacred mythology and ordinary stories or narrative. And because of this, the different types of stories can be analysed in different ways. And what research has shown is that uh, the stories that discuss how the landscape of Australia changed due to this rising sea levels tend to be mythologies with divine intervention enabling the event to happen and that these changes are often seen as punishments towards individuals or groups of people. 
Now, many of these stories were originally written down at the end of the 19th century by Europeans exploring the Australian continent. And whilst there is a risk of bias from these new arrivals, notes around some of these stories actually state that great care was taken not to influence what was being said. So this should increase the level of confidence we can have that most of the stories were noted down as accurately as possible. Now, researchers examined these stories and found 21 that mention events to do with the sea and changes to the coastline. And whilst these stories changed between different areas and regions of Australia, the underlying message was the same, that events happened with the sea that affected the landscape. And this is a core part of these 21 stories. The image I show now shows where the stories were collected from, and you can see how the coastline of Australia has shrunk due to rising sea levels from this glacial melt. In effect, Australia lost almost a quarter of its land mass in 20,000 years. And so with that, let's look at some of these stories to see what they say and what evidence they can provide to show their age. The first story is about a location known as Spencer Gulf and is told by the Narangaga tribe, I hope I pronounced that right, uh, who live on York Peninsula. Now they have a story about when Spencer Gulf was dry land, a marshy country reaching into the interior of Australia. And another story of this location says that this part of the world was filled with freshwater lagoons, each home to different types of birds, whilst the open country in between was occupied by emus and curlews and mallyfowls. But then both stories describe an initial flooding of the gulf, but not a slow or gradual flooding, but as having a catastrophic event. The reason given in the stories was because of a mythical giant kangaroo using a magic bone to cut a trench, allowing the sea to break through and for the water to come tumbling and rolling into this track that was dug out. And as the water flowed, it filled the lagoons and the marshes completely disappeared. Looking at this map, we can tell that for this to have happened at the lip of the gulf, the front of the gulf, then the sea level would have to have been 50 metres or 164 feet lower than today. Although, if the story occurs across the line marked AB on the map, the sea would only have to have been 22 metres or 72 feet below today's sea level. Now, there's been analysis of sediments between Port Piri and Wyala, and that confirms that there was a rapid inundation of water. And this was confirmed in analysis looking at the south side of Spencer Gulf as well. And the dating of the inundation was between 6,365 and 8,445 years ago. And so this story must be at least around this age. The next story we'll look at comes from Kangaroo Island, which lies at the mouth of the Gulf of St. Vincent. The story is about the drowning of a channel, which is known today as Backstairs Passage. And it involves the ancestral hero called Gurundari, who had two wives who were trying to run away from him. And he saw them cross a strip of land, or in another version of the story, they crossed where there were boulders where you could wade or swim between to get to Kangaroo Island. And this land they crossed is the channel known today as Backstairs Passage. But Ngurundi is angry by the women's escape. And in his anger, he forces the sea to rise, producing a terrible flood. Waters were said to have come with a terrific rush, sweeping the women south into the open ocean, drowning them and turning them into rocks that now jut out of the water between the island and the mainland. Rocks that are known today as the pages and are on this map. If this story is based on true geographical changes, it would mean that they originated at a time when the sea levels were 32 metres or 100 feet lower than they are today, making this story around 9,800 to 10,650 years old. Next, we have a story from the Wellesley Islands. We sit on the continental shelf of the north of Australia. They would have formed a land bridge connecting Australia to New Guinea. Because of the flat nature of the continental shelf and its size, the rise of sea levels here would have had been far more noticeable than at any other part of the Australian coast. Here again, the story is told of a giant kangaroo that gouged the trench with a magic bone. And white capped waves and a torrent of water poured in, spilling into the marshlands and flooding the lagoons until they overflowed. And that is how the Great Gulf came to be, 
and a story that is remarkably similar to the one I mentioned about Spencer Golf. But also from this area, there are stories that describe the creation of five of the Wellesley Islands, uh, and they were created when Gongur, a seagull woman, who swept down and dragged her raft across the peninsula back and forth, carved a hole that would eventually allow the sea to pour in. The sea here is only 5 to 10 metres deep, so no deeper than 30 feet, and as such it is grouped with the younger stories at around 8,000 years old. And in the final story I'll mention, we shall look at the Tiwi people from around the Bathurst and Melville Islands. They have a story that starts like this. In the beginning of the world, there was complete darkness. And from this darkness, one day an old blind woman miraculously appeared. And her name was Mangdankala. Although there are some stories that have her digging herself out of the ground and making a hole. And as Mangdankala crawled along the land, she carved out islands. And the water followed her and continued into the place that we call Clarence Strait today. She continued to move over the land known as Bathurst Island until finally water flowed into what is now known as Apsley Strait. This reference of crawling may be an inference to the water being shallow, meaning that crossing could occur but there was still a need to wade or swim through the water. For this to be the case then the sea levels would have had to been 12 metres lower or 40 feet, although it could have been as much as uh, 20 metres lower or 65 feet from today's level and the story would still have been possible. And from sea level data, this would make this story around 8,200 to 9,650 years old. Now, there are many other stories, I say 21 in all, which I can go over in another video if there is demand. But for now, what do all these stories really mean? Well, all these stories I've mentioned are all similar in how they recall a time on the Australian coastline where the coastline suffered some kind of flooding and part of that coastline is now permanently underwater. Some stories are narrative, some mythology, and whilst half of these came directly from Aboriginal sources, half the research came via this European documentation. And so, as I said, could be subject to alteration or even mistranslation. But with 21 stories across the entire coastline, it would seem as though these pieces of evidence when combined together, must give us confidence that these stories are credible rather than having been made up to explain the current land and seascape. Besides, it's very unlikely a story is made up about land disappearing. Normally stories about landscape changes discuss additions to the landscape, maybe a meteorite crater or holes in the ground, not land that is flooded and that you can't see anymore, we can now look at the sea level rise aligned to these stories on these graphs. The first shows the Wellesley Island event and the Bathurst and Melville Island flooding event happening between 7,500 and 10,000 years ago. And the next graph shows the Kangaroo Island and the Spencer Gulf events, alongside other events, happening up to 13,000 years ago. And this, all together, tells us two things that humans observed a post-glacial sea level rise and that some cultures are able to demonstrate an extraordinary life inaccuracy of an orally told story. Now, there'll be some of you linking these sea level rises to the flood story, either Noah or Gilgamesh or others that we know of and told in ancient times. And there are stories from India and the Eastern Mediterranean. But these stories are far more fragmented in where they are told and how. And they have suffered from this narrative embellishment through the generational journey, meaning the sources of the stories cannot be accurately assessed. It is just supposition that these relate to the sea level rise associated with the post-glacial maximum. It may just add some confidence to those who feel these stories could be connected. So, given this, does this mean that the Aboriginal oral storytelling ability is unique? Are there other cultures in other places of the world telling stories that are 10,000 years old? Well, as mentioned earlier, there are a number of environmental and cultural considerations that give rise to a perfect stage on which to tell these stories within the Aboriginal culture. The need for accuracy and teaching of the landscape that is so important to them, coupled with their isolation. 
And this is without consideration of the conservative nature of Aboriginal culture when compared to, let's say, the more innovative nature of the Proto-Indo-European cultures. And there is this Aboriginal mantra of got to tell this story the right way. However, it is impossible to go back in time to prove these stories were being told orally, but it's now also impossible to prove they weren't. But the sea level rise had a huge impact on Aboriginal culture. Australia lost nearly 25% of its land mass in this time. But to continue to tell these stories thousands of years after the events that caused them, events that haven't happened since, well, why were they remembered? I mean, why tell a story about an island that you can't see, that is no longer part of the landscape, such as marshlands disappearing in a couple of the stories? Is it because the story is part of a package of stories that have always been told? That it is part of the story of the culture to tell them? What does seem likely is that research from around these 21 stories, from the 21 coastline places around Australia, are an incredibly rare example of orally transmitted stories many thousands of years old, and not yet affected by other cultures' embellishments. Embellishments that we have seen have affected the Proto-Indo-European folk tales we've discussed in previous videos. So perhaps they should be captured properly, and kept as an archive of such an important piece of human cultural history. But there is one more story about this age that we know of. But the evidence isn't as strong due to the lack of data, due to being a single event from a single place. And that comes from North America, but I'll cover that in a future video. And of course, we have the oldest story that we know of still to come in this series of videos. And there's something older than that too. And I'll get to those videos oh, as soon as I can. So please like this video and subscribe to the channel if you enjoy these. It helps a lot and costs you nothing to do and the support is really appreciated. So thank you. And for those who have stayed until the end, I'll also place a reference to the original paper by Reed and Nunn in the description below of this video in case you want to look further into this. And so until the next video, please stay safe and stay well. And this is Crack and Fold.